Welcome back friends to another episode. So in this episode I would like to talk about the future of photography as far as gear, right? The camera. It's almost like kind of like the state of the union address or it'd be kind of like the state of the camera industry address. So there are basically two schools of thought on where the camera industry is going in the future. And let's examine something here, okay? So there are the two schools. One is in the October, October of 2011. Apple introduced the iPhone 4S. So uh, b before that, the mobile the mobile phone industry would, could never compete with serious photography as far as camera bodies and lenses. Right? It was it was kind of cliche, kitschy, right? But it wasn't up to par to serious photography. 4S, October 11, game changer. Okay, it showed that Apple is in the business now of serious photography. It could compete. The image quality from the 4S could compete with the image quality from cameras, actual dedicated standalone cameras. Advanced now to the present day, late 2016, early 2017, Apple unveils the iPhone 7 Plus. Okay, there's the 7 and the 7 Plus. The 7 Plus is absolutely marketed toward photographers, people who are serious toward photography. And the images, if you just, I challenge you to go, go to Flickr and look up groups dedicated to the 7 Plus. Or even stand on. You can look at you can look at photos. There's photos people groups, so you can do it in photos or, or groups. But look for the seven plus. And the images are. If you when you look at the image, you swear it came from a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. They're that good. So so here's my two schools of thought. I'm trying to to, to build the road to the the schools of thought. So so the seven plus. You there could be two schools. The first school would say the seven plus is so good that's eliminated all of the down market. So it's, it's replacing compact point and shoot and it's replacing uh, APS-C. So those who want to pursue serious photography will either gravitate toward the uh, upper end uh, mirrorless like the A7 or they will gravitate toward the DSLR or even medium format. Okay, so like your Fujifilm GFX 50S or Phase 1 or whatever, Hasselblad. So they're so the, the, seven, the 7 Plus will capture all of the lower end market and then there's the upper end market that gets to be satisfied by other avenues. That's the first school. The second school would be that the 7 Plus, mobile phone photography in general, has introduced us to a new type of photography and that is the small form factor. That you no longer need big cameras to produce high quality images. So therefore, people have become spoiled to the small form factor of a smartphone, and therefore, when they do go up market, those those who want to pursue serious photography, when they do reach out for a camera, it will be analogous to a, to a smartphone. So they want a compact body, right, for portability. And I'm of the second school. I believe the DSLR and the upper end mirrorless. I believe they really don't have a future for that particular reason, for small form factor, portability, and that old saying, there's no saying that's ever been more true than the best camera is the one that you have with you. Okay, so again, I'm from the second school, and I believe the camera that's going to be around in the long run is the, the advanced compact. Now, the, the I forgot what the organization, you can, you can Google and, and data mine camera sales. But it's misleading, and here's why it's misleading. It's point and shoot. The genre or the category is labeled point and shoot. Now, I do believe, for years, that was the $99 market. I don't know how long you've been around, but for years, you could go to Best Buy or Circuit City, when Circuit City was still around, or, or your different retailers like Walmart and such, and you could buy a point and shoot camera for $99, okay? But the, the lens was inferior, it didn't have a lot of controls on it. So for a serious photographer, it was it was a no-go because again you were limited. You just basically powered the camera on and shot. There wasn't a lot of you couldn't configure it to, to your artistic vision. Now here's why I want to show you the camera. I'll just cut right to the chase. I bought this camera. This is the Panasonic Lumix LX100, and I've never owned a better camera. No. I just want to give you the, the bluff, right? The bottom line up front. This camera will compete with my D750 mated with this gigantic, with the gigantic 24 through 70 f2.8. That's a $4,000 rig, $2,000 body, $2,000 lens, 
The images are spectacular, but this, this competes with a $4,000 rig. Look at the form factor. It's small, portable, take everywhere, $700. Okay, so let's get into the specifics of why I feel, point by point, why this camera is the future of the camera industry, okay? So we talked about the compact form a few weeks ago. So here's what I do. Every day before I report for duty, I live off post. I maintain this apartment. This 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 is an apartment that's been furnished for me, but I've basically vacated it. So long story short, when I leave in the morning, I usually leave a half an hour, and I find out a new place. I search out a new place every morning on the way to work to photograph. That's my leisure time. I give myself 30 minutes every morning to just photograph something new. So I'll deliberately drive and hunt something out. About three weeks ago, I was gonna go shoot with my DSLR. I had three bags, three big bags. It was my D750, the big 24 through 70, and I had, a, had another bag with the 51.8 or so forth and so on. But anyways, it came to three big bags. And I picked them up and I was about to walk out of my apartment and I said, Forget it. This is ridiculous. I'm gonna go. I got three hulking bags full of equipment to go take photos. I'm done. I dropped the bags and I've never picked up my D750 since. I haven't shot with my D750 in a long time. Just for that reason, it's huge. Now, in the olden days, so let's talk about this. In the olden days, we had the the Rolex. Let's say the Rolex TLR twin lens reflex. Okay, it was it was actually kind of compact. It wasn't too big, but the top lens obviously was for for viewing and acquiring, because the, as you focus, both lenses moved in a single plane, right? The bottom lens was the taking lens. So this was, was 1960s and before, basically. So late 1960s, 1970s, the SLR comes along, film SLR. Now, it was a fairly large uh, form factor with the pentaprism, and some, you know, the pentaprism because of the way, as opposed to a rangefinder, you could look, you could actually see what the camera was going to capture, okay? Because there was no sensor, and there was no digital sensor, there was film. It was a film plane, so they had to build a mirror box, the mirror assembly, in there so that you could see what the final image was going to look like. So what is funny, it's like, uh, so when we went digital, the camera manufacturers stuck with that paradigm. The, the DSLR literally was an extension of the SLR, the film single lens reflex, and they kept the, they kept the mirror assembly. Well, we found that it's not necessary anymore. When mirrorless came along, it showed us that the old, large, hulking form factor of DSLR was no longer necessary. It had been what we call OBE, overcome by events or overcome by technology. It was called a disruptive technology. Mirrorless was a disruptive technology. It, it, it smacked in the face of the old school SLR, that the mirror assembly was no longer necessary. You could see what your image was going to look like by a live feed on the sensor, okay? No mirror necessary. So it led, what well my point is, it led to a small compact form factor camera. The next one, Ansel Adams talked about this, and you cannot get this with the DSLR through the optical viewfinder. So I found on my LX100, and I'm gonna show you here, I also have, just for form factor, I have my X-T1. This is a Fujifilm X-T1. And it's smaller than a DSLR, but look at, look at the difference in the form factor. You can already tell. This is cumbersome, right? It's kind of difficult, right? To, it wobbles everywhere. When you walk, you know, it does this whole thing, you know, when you, you know what I'm talking about. It swings wildly back and forth. But this, this, this doesn't. But I'm getting back to the EF, EF, EVF, electronic viewfinder. When I walk up, when I see something, when my eye cuts, I never do this. I never do this because I visualize it. I'm visualizing the image. I, there's no need for me to, to do this craziness, okay? So I see something I want to photograph. I already know what the final image looks like. And Ansel Adams talked about this extensively through creative visualization. You know what the photograph is going to look like before you ever even take it. Just by looking at something, I know my final image. Now back then with Ansel, it was the printing process, right? But for us, it's camera raw or Lightroom, Photoshop, so forth and so on. But you already know what the image is going to look like. To, to facilitate that, when you look through an EVF, now here's what I do. I put my camera on spot metering. I don't want to use matrix or evaluative because as you 
the, the, really the image isn't going to vary because it's taking in the whole scene. I don't even use center weighted, I use spot because what I'm looking for, I'm looking for the exposure, I'm looking for the sky, I'm looking for everything to be just right. So what I do is I put it on spot metering, I get my, I get my uh, exposure, okay, I lock my exposure. I then adjust for, for the, the image, if I'm using shout, then I get what, what do I want in focus? I half press the shutter to lock focus, and then I recompose. So it's a three-stage process. I get exposure, move, get focus, move, whole frame, fully depress the shutter, I got my image. So it's a three-step process, okay? And that's basically what Ansel Adams always talked about. And that's available to us now when you do those three things, lock, lock exposure, lock focus, right? And then take the image, capture the image, okay? Again, that's with spot metering. Um, so we covered that zoom. This now, what, what's the difference between this and the X100T, and the X100F, X100F, and the original X100? Is those are fixed. Those are fixed. and I'm not a big fan of a fixed focal length. Okay, it's limiting. They say zoom with your feet. They're, they're, uh, uh, okay. Now, two sayings in photography. One is very true. The, the best camera you have is the camera you have with you. The biggest fallacy, the biggest misleading and false saying ever in the history of photography is zoom with your feet. That is not true because you're getting a certain either expansion. A focal length offers you expansion or compression in a photograph, okay? It's not walking back and walking forward to get your composure, okay? That's not what it's all about. And half the time, like if you're in Rome, if you've ever been to Rome, you'll notice the streets are very narrow in Rome, in Marrakesh, Morocco. So you cannot zoom with your feet in Rome in Marrakesh, okay? You have to have the proper proper focal length to get you what you're looking for. A lot of times I, I know that I'm in traffic. I can only back up so far and there's a highway or a road behind me. I can't back up any further or I'll get hit by a car. So we need to put that zoom with your feet nonsense to bed right now. You don't zoom with your feet. You use a proper focal length to get your image, okay? This is a zoom. This is the equivalent of a 24 through 75. Again, it facilitates, you, you're getting your image. You, again, we're getting back to Ansel Adams, your creative vision. You choose the focal length to get your shot. You don't zoom with your feet, okay? Uh, so next, it has a flash that comes in the bag. It comes with the camera. So if you want to throw a flash on there, you can. Hot shoe. So this is this is what's different from the RX100, the Sony RX100. Even though that's a small form factor, I think it was the only two of the five iterations, the one, two, three, four, and five. They only made the two, I believe it was the two with a hot shoe, and they discontinued it with the three onward. But again, they didn't want to cannibalize their higher end sales. But Panasonic did is they included the hot shoe. So if you want to take this into a studio, you want to shoot a model. You throw your pocket wizard in here, you throw a young Nuo wireless transmitter, right? You've got your strobes, you're doing a you're doing a pro quality photo shoot with this camera, and it can. Okay, again, hot shoot. We talked about mirrorless. There's no mirror in the camera. Okay, so I the, the reason I'm going here with this is the size of the photo site. It's an 18 square micron photo site, okay? And that's fairly large. For, in a, now in a DSLR it would not be, but in this it's more than enough because two things. Number one, there's no mirror. There's no mirror that's slapping, raising up and slapping and causing vibration into the sensor. And the second thing is there's no focal plane shutter in this camera, right, near the sensor. It's a little tiny leaf shutter in the lens. So when you take those two, so that's why I'm saying Panasonic is so far ahead of the game because they realize with, with mirrorless technology, if you want the cleanest image you can possibly get, you need to eliminate two things that cause vibration in the body of the camera that can cause vibration at the time of capture. The way you do that is you eliminate the mirror. So we're number one, we're in a mirrorless system. And number two, you eliminate the focal plane shutter. You move the shutter into the lens of the, of, right into the lens, the small little leaf shutter. Therefore, this, the, the, the sensor does not vibrate and your resulting image is crystal clear. And the, the images from this I'm seriously, I, I just can't express how clean these images, the image quality is off the chart in this LX100. Okay, uh, the next thing is is the small form factor, right, this this lens is so small that we're all, all even powered on. Now this might sound, this might sound funny to you and I don't mean it to be funny. This is small enough that I can get it through a cyclone fence or what's known as a, 
a chain link fence, chain link fence, okay? So there have been three instances when I've been out shooting where a DSLR, even my X-T1, I couldn't get it through the, through the little diamond shape of the fence. I would have to have the fence in the shot. On three occasions, I was on top of a bridge, I was in a, in a, like a shipping yard where I wanted to photograph some pallets. They had some, like, in a, in a shipping and receiving. Yeah, I couldn't get in, right, but there was a chain link fence. I, put, I actually pushed this through the chain link fence and got the pallets. Same on top of the highway, you know, on top of a highway to prevent people from jumping, you know, suicide jumpers, right? You have this chain link, chain link fence to prevent people from jumping. Well, I didn't want the chain link fence in the frame. Pushed it through the diamond, got my shot. So this alone, this alone will get you the shot you're looking for because you can push it through a chain link fence or what's known as a cyclone fence, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up. And again, I, I want to finish on image quality. This is a micro four third sensor. So there are f basically five sensors that are, that are in play right now, right? There's the, the big medium format, then full frame, APS-C, micro four thirds and then the one inch, okay? The RX100 is of the one inch variety. This is four thirds, then a little bit bigger is like your Fujifilm, uh, right? The Fujifilm X-T1, which I just showed you, the X100, TX100, that those are APS-C cameras. So the new threshold, the new minimum threshold to enter serious photography is the one inch sensor. This is a, a one step above that, and micro four thirds, and it even has different aspect ratios. So I can move the lever to th three, three, three to two, 16 to 9, 1 to 1, like the Richard Avedon, right, the classic Roly, 1 to 1, you remember that was 6 centimeter by 6 centimeter, 1 to 1, and then I can also use 4, four to 3 aspect ratio. So, I mean, in, in the, the exterior control, so that was my last point, was what differentiates, differentiates this from the old point and shoots, this, the $99 point and shoots, because you power, those you powered on and shot. Well, smartphones are doing that today, so you don't need a point and shoot. But this is how that the camera industry, I forgot, the, it's a four letter, four letter acronym. The, they're not fleshing out and, and looking at with granularity at the different, the different genres or categories within point and shoot. Now this is called an advanced compact, okay? And it's got the exterior controls. I've got the exposure compensation. I've got the shutter, the shutter's on the top. The aperture is built right here. I can move the aperture here on the, on the lens. So it's, it's like a DSLR, where is that for a serious photographer, you have all the controls right here at your disposal, and there's a quick menu here. There's, it's, there's, a, there's the full menu, and there's something called the quick menu. I hit the quick menu, and those are your most used settings. I choose my ISO there. It's a fraction of a second. Even though there's not a dedicated dial on top of the camera for ISO, I've got it literally within two or three seconds, I can change my ISO. So I'm gonna wrap this up. The, I believe this in all sincerity, that the future of the camera industry is, this is the perfect camera. I've never had a camera more perfect than this Lumix LX100. And I'm, I'm not pimping gear. I know there's some criticism up there about people who are pimping gear. You don't find any links. You look at, there's no links to Amazon, B&H, Adorama. I'm getting no cutbacks. I'm not, uh, kickbacks rather. I'm not sponsored by Fujifilm or, or uh, Panasonic. So, there's, I have no, in full disclosure, I have no interest in promoting this camera financially. Now, I'm promoting this camera because I have never had a camera that does all this for $700. Again, now my D750 and that big 24 through 70 can do what this, but it's $4,000. This is $700, and it can do anything my D750 can do, anything. So, again... When we talk about the future of photography and where photography is going, I think the DSLR is dead. I think the bigger mirrorless cameras like the, like the bigger Fuji films are, are, are going to die out. And I believe this is where the industry is going to settle. That, you know, the, the, this, is where it at, this is where it's at because you don't need full frame anymore. Full frame was the big player in town to get great image quality. If you remember going back in the mid-2000s, 2007, 8, if you wanted serious, serious image quality, you had to go full frame. Then slowly, we've been to the point now that one of the most recent Magnum photographers, Matt Black, this gentleman's name is Matt Black, and he shoots with an RX100. He was inducted or pulled into Mag the Magnum group shooting a one-inch sensor.